Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is you're watching this. And as always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to edition 47 of Left Side of the Aisle. This is for uh, first week of March 2012. Um, I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. And for the next almost half hour, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, as always, any comments, questions, reactions, brickbats, platitudes, whatever, can be directed to me uh, directly. Uh, my email address is hoviating, that's W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G, at AOL.com. Uh, and if you didn't catch that, my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, will be up around over here somewhere uh, a couple of times during the course of the show, and you can get the... Um, the, web, the, the email address from there. Uh, the one request I make is that if you do email me that you please in the subject line include something like you know your cable show or left side of the aisle or something like that so that I, uh, I know it's not spam. And uh, be a little patient. I do answer my mail sometimes a little slow about it but I do answer it. Okay with the necessary preliminaries out of the way uh, let's get to it. The first thing up is good news, and I always like to start with good news whenever I can. This actually is something from a couple of weeks ago. I, I actually wanted to use this last week, but I really didn't have time for it. But I like it enough. I'm going to include it here. Uh, some of you may remember the case of Republic Windows and Doors. This was a company outside Chicago with about 250 employees. And in 2008, it closed its factory without giving the employees the legally required notice of the closing which also meant denying them the uh, uh, severance pay, accrued uh, vacation time, and the temporary health benefits to which they are also legally entitled. Well, instead of passively accepting this, like good little worker drones are supposed to, the, uh, the employees who were members of the United Electrical Workers, they decided to do something, and they sat in at the plant. They occupied the plant. They refused to leave. And one of these occasional happy coincidences, uh, this action caught the attention of the media, caught the attention of the public. Uh, and the fact that attention got intensified when it was revealed that the reason the plant was closing was because Bank of America, which had just a couple of days before gotten a $25 billion bailout from the federal government, had refused to extend the company's credit line. Well, after six days of occupation, the workers won. Bank of America agreed to renew the credit line so the company could pay the workers uh, what it owed them. And what's more, a new company that was called uh, Sirius Energy, they bought the factory and pledged to uh, rehire all of the original workforce. They actually started with a fraction of the force, uh, started uh, production with the idea that uh, they would bring more and more people back as business picked up. Unfortunately, it didn't. Now, the union knew and agreed that the company was in trouble, but it still got blindsided. On February 23rd, the company announced that it was closing immediately. Now, the union said it wanted an agreement for the plant to remain open for a while so that maybe another buyer could be found or maybe the... Um, uh, so that the, you know that the workers wouldn't lose their jobs, but the company refused. So the plant is closing again. So what's the good news here? The good news is it's deja vu all over again. Uh, the workers occupied the plant. They refused to leave. This Occupy was actually aided by Occupy. That is, Occupy Chicago came and offered support. Uh, they organized media coverage, they organized food for the workers occupying the plant, and their presence on the street outside the plant successfully dissuaded, and I do mean dissuaded, not blocked, they successfully dissuaded the police from arresting the people occupying the plant. In less than 24 hours, an agreement was reached to keep the plant open an additional 90 days in the hopes of either finding a buyer or for the workers to have time to arrange to buy it themselves. And by the way, an important footnote to this, uh, the members of the union credited the presence of Occupy Chicago with getting this agreement. 
uh, especially as quickly as they did. They said that when the uh, corporate executives who are based in California, when they heard that Occupy Chicago was present, they, in the words of the union, panicked and were willing to come to a settlement quite quickly. All right, I'm going to move on from there uh, to something else that's been in the news recently. And the truth is, as much as I would like to never even have to mention the name or the existence of right-wing blowhard Lush Dimblaw, I can hardly be among those failing to express their delight about the fact that he's put his foot in it big this time. This involves a case, you probably heard about this, but I'm going to go through it quickly just in case you haven't. It involves the case of Sandra Fluck. She's a 30-year-old law student at Georgetown University. And she was to testify at a House committee hearing on the subject of, uh, of uh, birth control and insurance coverage of birth control. The Gopper, the Republican majority on the committee, refused to allow her to testify. So the Democratic minority had their own hearing in which she did testify, and the right-wing propaganda machine went berserk with, with Dimbla leading the way. For three days, he went after Sandra Fluck. He called her a slut. He called her a prostitute. He said she's having so much sex, it's amazing she can still walk. He labeled her an immoral, baseless, no-purpose-to-her-life woman. He said her parents should go into hiding. Now, the outcry that came in response to this unbridled misogyny, probably much to Jim Blah's surprise, was so massive that even he couldn't stand up to it, especially when his advertisers started deserting him in droves. So Rust, which that's not a mispronunciation of his name, that's a reference to what's in his skull, um, Rust offered what some folks unfamiliar with the concept of dictionary called an apology. But no matter, despite that, Despite that phony non-apology, he's still in free fall. At last account, the total of advertisers that have deserted him uh, is over 30. And at least two stations, two radio stations, have dropped him from their list. Now, the likelihood here is that he will survive this. Uh, he won't be off the air. The likelihood is it'll be able to continue. But two important things, and two related important things have come out of this. One... People now know, especially people on the right and the Republicans now know that they can cross him without it, without it, uh, uh, you know, wind up having to apologize. And two, his brand has been permanently damaged by this. And uh, that's to the good. Now, others have covered this whole thing more than adequately, okay? But I had a few quick thoughts that I haven't seen discussed much on these points, or at least... Maybe I just didn't look in the right places, but um, at least not adequately. Now, one, it was gratifying, if nothing else in this, it was gratifying to see the, geez, I was only joking, don't you have a sense of humor nonsense, won't fly, at least not all the time anymore. I mean, that line has served as a get-out-of-jail-free card for all kind of racist and sexist crap for far too long. All right, second... Something Limbaugh said. 30 years old, a student at Georgetown Law who admits to having so much sex she can't afford it anymore. She's having sex so frequently that she can't afford all the birth control pills that she needs. What? What? I mean, is, 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 is Limburger as abysmally ignorant as he comes on here? I mean, is it possible? Is it possible for any grown man in this country to be so uninformed, so totally out of the loop in his mind, such a total twit, as to think that the cost of birth control pills is directly related to how much sex you're having? The rational mind reels. And now he also groused that his uh, that his failing in his three days of vituperation, excuse me, humor, that in his three days of vituperation, he became like the people we oppose. In other words, us. Now, it is true that those of us on the left can't claim that we don't engage in name calling. I mean, consider me, for example. Uh, the thing is, though, for one thing, our name calling, a lot of cases would properly be called mockery rather than name calling. It's, but no matter, 
the important thing here is that there is a real difference. When we go after people, when we name call, it is all but exclusively directed at the famous, the rich, the powerful. All too often, when the right goes after people, it's people like Sandra Fluck. Ordinary private individuals, I mean, no particular power or influence. In fact, you probably would still be unaware of Sandra Fluck if, if um, Daryl is a jerk, the, the, the chair of that House committee had had the sufficient brains to simply allow her to testify in the first place. The thing is, the language used by the opposing sides may be similar, but the targets are not. All right, this is something that has been mentioned in regard to this, but I personally think not often enough or loud enough. How in blazes did requiring insurance companies to cover contraceptive care become, quote, a new welfare program, unquote? How did having insurance cover something become a taxpayer's subsidy for sex? I mean, it's become the fallback position of the right, it seems. I've even gotten this on, in comments on my blog, this exact argument. In, in fact, Bill O'Reilly, the man with the world's most perfect initials, Bill O'Reilly took it up, making the same idiotic claim that having insurance cover birth control is somehow government, that is, taxpayer, uh, paying you to have sex. I mean, it makes no sense. Not that what the right says often does, but this is a particular case of that. All right, now last, but by no means least, an urgent message to the entire left half of the American political spectrum most particularly to those who could actually be called progressives as opposed to liberals simply trying to rebrand themselves as progressives because they wanted to, like the political cowards they are, scuttle away from the right wing saying nasty things about the L word, but to actual progressives. Stop playing by the right wing's rules. Stop letting the right wing frame the issue and frame the debate. Now, what raises this here is that a lot of the discussion that's been gone on, a lot of the response from the left, and I was actually originally going to say a lot of the defense of Sandra Fluck, but there's actually been very little of that because very little was needed because she didn't do anything wrong. Uh, but much of the response from the left has revolved around Rush Limbaugh doesn't understand that some medical conditions require birth control for the women's health. Now, the thing is, that's true on both points. Some medical conditions do require birth control, and Rush Limbaugh doesn't understand that. But there's a flaw in that argument, in that it essentially concedes that wanting birth control in order to have sex without getting pregnant is something bad or shameful that should not be discussed, that should be hidden away. Well, frankly, screw that, which is a rather appropriate uh, double entendre in this case. Um, the right wing... The right wing charge is that women are sexually active and they get birth control to avoid getting pregnant. So what? So what? What, is this Armageddon? Are the mountains gonna tremble? Is the sky gonna rip open? Uh, are the oceans gonna boil? Women wanna have sex. Oh, the horror, the horror. Let there be gnashing of teeth, rending of garments and wailing in the streets. I mean, yeah. Look, we know the right wing has hang-ups about sex. We know that's, there, that's no news. I mean, consider that the Republican Party of Lawrence County, South Carolina, wants you to sign a pledge with 28 principles on it before you can get on the Republican primary ballot there. Those principles include swearing that you never had premarital sex, and from that day forward, you will never look at pornography. The thing is, for that very reason... For that very reason, we should not let the right, even implicitly, even by suggestion, set the grounds for debate such that we limit ourselves to birth control can be useful in, certain, in, in treating certain medical conditions. I said last week that one of the ways that right-wing ideas get mainstreamed is that the right wing will often enough say what it actually wants, say what it actually thinks without mouthing platitudes. Well, too often, we're too concerned with what sounds good, but not too dramatic. In other words, what sounds nice right now. So to any rightist who's, who goes on about birth control and morality and their concerns about morality, well, I say, and we should all say, good.
because women have as much right to sex and to sexual pleasure as men do, and we are sick and tired of you trying to deny that. Bug off. And we will be back after a quick break. And we're back with um, our regular feature, the Outrage of the Week. It's a very quick one this week. While we've been worrying about affording health care, paying the mortgage or our rent, about feeding our kids and all the rest of that, we have really been, we should be ashamed of ourselves because we've forgotten something far more important. The rich have it so much worse than we do. Last Wednesday, Bloomberg News carried an article, gave 1,700 words, uh, giving the 1% room to grouse about how tough it is to make it on $350,000 or more a year, and to whine about how, quoting one, people who don't have money don't understand the stress involved in, for example, having to give up your $7,500 a year country club membership because your bonus was only $125,000 this year. Now, I could go on, but I think the point is already made. Obviously, not everyone who uh, makes over $350,000 a year, which is what it takes to put you in the top 1%, not all of those people are grasping out-of-touch scumbags with overdeveloped senses of entitlement. But the fact is, enough are. And those people, they are what defines the term the 1%. And they are an outrage this or any other week. All right, moving on to something important here, something really important. Last week, Attorney General Eric Holder gave a speech at Northwestern University to explain why it is legal for the president to issue an order to have you killed. This goes back, obviously, to the case of Anwar al Olaki. Uh, he's a natural-born American citizen who was living in Yemen. Uh, he was assassinated in a drone attack in September. He was killed amid uh, government accusations that he was connected to al-Qaeda, that he'd been in contact with three of the 9-11 hijackers, and that he'd been in contact with the so-called underwear bomber, a guy named Umar Farouk Abdulmutallab. But the fact is, no proof, no evidence of any sort was actually issued, just the statement, just the assertion. And there was certainly nothing that any normal person would find to have even a hint of the due process that you would think at least would be his due as an American citizen. The Obama administration still has not released the legal memo uh, justifying the attack as legal, despite requests from members of Congress and Freedom of Information Act requests from the American Civil Liberties Union and the New York Times. But Holder, he had a go at offering what might be considered an unclassified version of the legal memo. And what was the argument he made? When it comes down to it, the argument was, it's legal because we said it is. Or as Richard Nixon once said, when the president does it, it's legal. In fact, contrary to what you might have thought, according to the amazing Mr. H, the idea of due process does not mean that anyone could offer a check on this executive power to execute executions. It does not mean that the White House has to show its evidence to anyone. It does not mean that anyone outside the president's circle needs to be involved in any way at all at any point along the line. Quoting Holder, due process and judicial process are not one and the same, particularly when it comes to national security. The Constitution guarantees due process, not judicial process. And one thing, I almost imagine the... uh, um, the echo effect being turned up when he said, national security. All right, so what does constitute due process, according to Mr. H? That is, it is when the executive branch, which means the president, ultimately, means the president, again alone, decides that the accused is guilty. In the case of national security, when the president decides you're guilty, that's the end of the matter. There's no need to present evidence, no need for any sort of outside process, no need for any independent judgment, no need for anything that could in any way be called a hint of a trial, even a trial in the court of public opinion. 
There simply is nothing to restrain the president either in making the decision of guilt or in acting on that decision. The president is the investigator, the prosecutor, the judge, the jury, and the executioner, all in one. Now, some people are going to say, I'm being unfair to Holder. I'm being unfair to him. Because he insisted there is a system of, and this is quoting, robust oversight. That oversight consists largely of telling some selected members of the intelligence committees of both houses of Congress what has been decided or done after it has been decided or done. This actually reminds me that there is another meaning to the word oversight. Still, he, still Holder pleaded, you have to understand. He quoted JFK's line about defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. And he said, we are in another such hour of maximum danger. We are a nation at war, he said. And where, where national security operations are at stake, due process takes into account the realities of combat. But the thing is, the war here, the war he's talking about, is a war without a specific target. I mean, terrorism can hardly be called a specific target. It is a war without geographic limit and with no way to determine what constitutes victory. It is a war, by definition, without end. It's a war in no particular place. It's everywhere, all the time. It's a war, then, in which almost anything can be justified as combat, as an act of war, as taking place on the battlefield, and thus beyond the reach of any law beyond the laws of war. Something, but something else Holder said, quoting him again, we must also recognize that there are instances where our government has the clear authority, and I would argue the responsibility, to defend the United States with the appropriate and lawful use of lethal force. Well... I doubt any, any non-pacifist, anybody who's not a pacifist, I doubt that they would disagree that the use of lethal force is sometimes necessary for legitimate national self-defense. The question is, who decides what's appropriate? Who decides when it's appropriate? Who decides and how do you decide? The point here is that when, when, when Holder says the government has the responsibility, he means the president as an individual alone without any outside check. The president is quite literally the decider in matters of life and death. If the vice president disagrees, tough, should have headed the ticket. If the chief justice at the Supreme Court thinks that preaching against the United States is not a capital offense, tough, should have gone into politics, not law. Um, if the Congress objects that the president's surgical strikes kill too many random innocent men, women, and children, hey, cry me a river. And if the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extrajudicial Killings expresses concern, eh, well, who cares about him anyway? In fact, it's not even desirable to get outside, uh, outside input because time is of the essence. We must act now. Because according to Holder, the authority to murder will only be used against someone who is an imminent threat. Now that could be a little reassuring if it wasn't for the fact that Holder also said, quoting again, the evaluation of whether an individual presents an imminent threat incorporates considerations of the relevant window of opportunity to act, which, if it means anything, means that to be an imminent threat does not mean you're about to launch an attack on the U.S. It doesn't mean you're about to, it doesn't mean you're even planning such an attack. It merely means that we believe that sometime in the future you will plan such an attack and we can get you right now. In fact, Holder said as much. Again, quoting him, the Constitution does not require the president to delay action until some theoretical end stage of planning when the precise time, place, and manner of an attack become clear. Now, when George Bush said stuff like that, we screamed about the dangers of preemptive war. In fact, Shrubstein did say stuff like that. Remember when, uh, I think it was Condoleezza Rice, who justified the coming invasion of Iraq by saying that we can't let the final proof be in the form of a mushroom cloud. Holder's language is more nuanced but the meaning is the same. We don't need no stinking proof. So that is the Obama pos uh, administration's position. Not only do we not need to show proof, we don't even need to have proof. All we need to do is believe. And our belief is the legal justification 
that we need to kill you. But don't worry, if it turns out later that we were wrong, hey, don't worry, we'll, we'll, write, we'll write a nice handwritten note of apology. And speaking of apologies, I hereby offer one to John Yu. By the way, as a footnote, here's a quote for you. As president, I will close Guantanamo, reject the Military Commissions Act, and adhere to the Geneva Conventions. Our Constitution and our Uniform Code of Military Justice provide a framework for dealing with the terrorist. Our Constitution works. We will again set an example for the world that the law is not subject to the whims of stubborn rulers and that justice is not arbitrary. The quote, as you probably guess, comes from presidential candidate Barack Obama in 2008. While Guantanamo is still open, the military commissions are still going, and the Geneva Convention is still being ignored. Ignored. The stubborn rulers with their arbitrary justice are closer in both time and space than we would like to tell ourselves. All right, ending up with a last quick item. I've got a couple of minutes left. It's, about, it's an RIP to a website. It's called Scroogle. Uh, the name came from the idea this was a Google scraper. Scroogle was a nonprofit, actually, outfit. And what they would do is to try to protect privacy, because Google was notorious for gathering up all the information about the searches that people made that it could and keeping it. Well, what Scroogle would do is you would enter the search on their site, they would send that to Google and scrape off the top results and give them back to you. So as far as Google was concerned, the search request came from Scroogle, not you. And so you were still invisible and that degree of privacy maintained. Um, now, the uh, Scroogle, Scroogle, in fact, it proudly proclaimed, we don't use cookies, we don't retain search items, and logs are deleted within 48 hours. Well, after about 2010, Scroogle started to have increasing trouble with Google, uh, as Google did what's called throttling, which basically means you see a lot of traffic coming from one site, you simply block access, for, and that, that site's access to you for some period of time. Early on, it was 10 minutes, by the end, it was 90 minutes. Now that was a hassle, but it was survivable. What ultimately killed Scroogle was a series of what are called DDoSs, that is, directed denial of service attacks. This is where someone using some automated server directs so many inquiries at a site so fast that that site essentially grinds to a halt, drowning under a backlog of, of these inquiries. These attacks went on for days on end until finally the owner of the site, a man named Daniel Brandt, he pulled the plug. Now, there are other sites that uh, still allow for um, privacy-protecting searches. I've started using one called DuckDuckGo.com, but Scroogle was a star player, a five-star player in this, and its passing deserves a bit of notice. All right, that's it for me. I'm done. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here again. I want to thank the folks here at uh, Public Television for their help and their support and their assistance. Uh, we'll be doing this for almost a year now, and uh, we're going to keep on doing it as long as I can hold out and they can put up with me. So in the meantime, you just have the best week you possibly can, and we will see you next week. Bye. <laughs>